Hi, guys. Good morning, church. Thank you, Howard, for leading us in music. I mean, not music, but in conversation. Thank you, band, for leading us in music. Uh, good to see you guys. Happy Sunday. I just want you to know that I am so appreciative of, uh, of this church community allowing my family and I to escape for a week and get some uh, R&R and just know that everything is in great hands. So thank you, band, for, for stepping up. Thank you, Greg Tonkinson. Did you guys enjoy Greg? Got a little history with Greg, so he's a great guy. So glad he was able to share the word with us. Uh, and uh, I got to listen to the message as well. So uh, was blessed by that. And it's just good to be back. Good to see your faces. So uh, turn to Luke 19, if you would. Luke 19, we're continuing our journey in the, um, in the Gospel of Luke. Topic, Jesus for everyone. Isn't it good news that Jesus is for everyone? Woo! Today we get to uh, interact with a, uh, an interesting section of scripture, interesting passage. And, and I'm going to lead with this phrase, and I want you to maybe just remember it, write it down. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Uh, I saw this modeled in my life. I was thinking like what Howard was talking about. When, when we've grown up in, in environments where we've had pos positive role models, maybe not so positive role models from from dads, uncles, grandpas, whatever. I, I remember for me being a, a believer in Jesus Christ, surrounding myself with Paul Timothy relationships with some older Christian men. Uh, Pastor Ken was one of them. So I, I was saved uh, when I was 15. Uh, Pastor Ken kind of took me under his wings. And uh, here's what I love about Ken is that you would just pull up to his house and it was automatic youth group night at his house and we came uninvited. And Ken was one of those guys, just opened up his house, come in, played spades when I was 15 years old. Not for money at that time, it was just for prestige at that, at that time in my life. But um, Ken would just open up his house and I just grew to understand Ken being this gracious, kind, compassionate man until I challenged him publicly with something. We're in Ensenada, Mexico, building a camp for the, for the nationals down there in, in Mexico. And I got spicy with, Ken, believe it or not, Scott Morgan being spicy. Can you guys believe that? All right. I got a little spicy with Pastor Ken. And right there in front of the group, I said something to him. And Ken no longer was gracious, compassionate, or kind Ken. He was like, Scott, get over here right now. And in front of everybody, laid into me. And it was at that moment, meekness was not weakness. He had every right, and I'm going to call it, to share his righteous indignation toward me. There came a point when I took his grace for granted. There came a point when I took his kindness for granted. And so much so, I thought it was this comfortable, casual relationship until I crossed that line and he publicly rebuked me. You would think that would be the only time that happened in my life. <laughs> Pastor Greg, not toward me, but I saw a man who, kind, compassionate. There were some men who came to a church on a Sunday morning, and they were from a cult group. And they were part of the church community, and they started spreading some lies and deceit among the church. It was like if someone came in here from, from some group, and they started deceiving you. All of a sudden, I saw Greg go, go from meek to, to angry. And again, meekness is not weakness. He had a moment to confront some people that had stepped into the flock that he was in charge to oversee, and he laid into these guys. You should have seen it. It was the after, you know, it was a Baptist church, and you're thinking potluck. You're thinking, you know, kumbaya. We're having a great moment together. Right outside the church building, Greg was laying into these guys. Get out of here. You're not welcome here. And everyone's just like, meanness is not weakness. Right? There was a righteous indignation at that moment that those men were not welcome in that place because they were there to deceive and spread lies. Meanness is not weakness. Jesus, as much as you think he's the man bun convertible driving Messiah that you can feel casual and comfortable around, today is going to overturn that image. He is kind, he is meek, he is mild, but don't you think for a moment that there are moments when he will show forth 
a righteous indignation. Turn to Luke chapter 19. It's the famous passage where Jesus walks into the, to the temple and overturns tables. It's the it's passage in Luke where Luke wa uh, Jesus walks into the temple and, and just, just starts just wreaking havoc. And I, and, I, and I love this scene because it shows us some precious things that we need to understand that, you know, we sometimes can get a little too casual, too comfortable with God and not understand that, that God wants to protect certain things when it comes to his people and his purposes and his plans. And don't you think, don't you dare think for a minute that God doesn't have moments where he can have these moments of righteous indignation. And we see that here in Luke chapter 19. So turn your Bibles, if you would. We're going to see Jesus like we've never seen him before, which is always fun, right? And, and, and if Jerusalem was a beehive of activity, Jesus walks in and just starts, starts poking the hive. I'm that kind of guy. I like when people poke the hive. I'm the kind of guy that's like, oh, that fire's not big enough. Let's just squirt a little bit more gasoline on there. Anyone else like that out there? I'm the guy who, who comes up uh, with a, a, gets a rattlesnake, and I start throwing rocks at it. Like, let's, let's see how much more uh, intense this moment can get. Anyone else out there can identify with that? Okay. Jesus is going to hit this beehive with a stick, and he is going to show us that meekness is not weakness. So turn to Luke 19 if you're there. So Passion Week, we're at Monday. So remember two weeks ago, we were at Sunday, the famous triumphal entry where Jesus enters Jerusalem on the back of a foal or a colt. And this was his way of coming into his city as the coming king. Unfortunately, though, he wasn't going to be that military political overturner that people thought he was going to be. He's coming into Jerusalem to die on a cross. But Monday, the next day, holds something completely different for us. He returns this time to declare the failure of God's people to live up to their covenant mandate to be a blessing to the world. As we've been blessed, we are to be a blessing. And so Jesus comes in on Monday into the holy city to demonstrate his authority, his authority over the created world, his authority uh, to judge it. And so he's coming in and he's angry. And he has a right to be angry. This is his righteous indignation. So look at Luke chapter 19. Luke doesn't give us everything that happens on Monday, but he gives us this scene and he's the most, he's the most brief on this out of all the gospel writers. All the gospels talk about Jesus cleansing the temple, overturning the ta tables. So what we're, we're going to do is we're going to draw on the other gospels to give a fuller picture of what's happening here. But let's start at Luke 19. So look at verse 45. Jesus enters the temple and begins to cast out those who were selling, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer Mark the gospel as for all the nations. That's important to remember. Luke leaves it out because Luke, we already know, is communicating a Jesus for everybody. Mark just wants us to remember that the, the love of God is for all the nations. Can I get an amen from somebody? It's for all people. And you have made the house of God a den for robbers. And as he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among them were trying to destroy Jesus. And they could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging upon his words. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Four things I want us to look at as it relates to this Monday of Passion Week and talk about passion. Like I said, we're going to see Jesus like we've never seen him before. Four things. The first point actually doesn't come from this passage. We got to go back to Matthew chapter 21. So turn in your Bibles to, to Matthew 21. Go left a couple books, and we're going to see what actually happened to start this, this Monday. So we, we've all had a case of the Mondays, right? What do we think of when we think of Mondays? Blah. 
right? No one looks forward to Mondays, right? It's like you've, you've, you've gone all weekend. I mean, tomorrow's going to be different. Sons are going to sweep the, the nuggets, right? So we're all going to have a little bit more pep in our step. Can I get an amen? So, but Mondays typically are like, Mondays aren't fun, right? I think even the cure sing about, if the cure sings about a day of the week, you know it's got to be depressing, amen? <laughs> okay, obviously you guys aren't into the goth uh, alternative stuff of the 80s, but so Matthew 21, look at verses, um, let's look at verse 18. So here's the scene, I want to set up the scene, Mark, um, uh, Luke doesn't give us the entire Monday scene. Jesus and all the disciples just got done spending the night at their besties' house. Remember who their besties are? Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. What? I wonder if they're just hanging out playing, like, playing board games all night. You ever wonder what the disciples were doing? They're all hanging out, drinking beer, eating off charcuterie boards. I don't know what they're doing, but they're hanging out. They're having an overnight. I think this Monday, Jesus woke the disciples up early. And said, let's go. And I think he had a little bit of spice in his attitude. And I think the disciples were like, okay, it's Monday. Jesus, we're we're catching the hint. Let's go. Jesus starts out. And on the way to the temple, he shows forth another moment of righteous indignation, even before he gets to the temple to overturn tables. Matthew 21 gives us the account. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. I don't know about you, but when I become hungry, sometimes it leads into being hangry, right? Now, when Jesus is hungry and angry, look out. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves. He sees a fig tree. I don't know about you. I love figs. I love figs. He sees nothing on it. And he says to the tree, May no fruit ever come from you again. This is the Son of God, Jesus, who now looks at a tree that's not bearing fruit. He's hungry, and he curses that tree. And the fig tree withered at once. Now, I don't know about you. I've tried growing citrus trees in my backyard. I wish I could pull a Jesus like this on my, my trees. Anyone else with me on that one? It withers at once, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answers them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Why am I pointing this out before we even get to the temple? Because Jesus is already upset. He's already upset. First point in your notes, write this down. You have to understand that Jesus is exposing a lack of purpose and mission. He's exposing a lack of purpose. There is, n- let me just say, there is n- purpose for your life. And when you don't understand, and I'm going to tell you right now, this has nothing to do with finding your purpose. This has to do with finding God's purpose. And if those two aren't the same purposes, you're going to be miserable. You are, you are going to be dissatisfied. You're going to lack hope. You're going to lack joy. Because this world was never designed for you to fulfill your purpose. This world was designed for you to fulfill God's purpose. Now, I'm not against colleges that have the, the moniker, find your purpose. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is ultimately as followers of Jesus, which is the greatest source of your identity, until you find God's purpose, you will be purposeless. So Pastor Scott, how does purpose relate to what Jesus cursing the fig tree? <laughs> fig trees were the symbol of Israel. And because Jesus appro- approaches the fig tree, he is not hangry in the sense of not having food for his belly, he's angry because the nation of Israel, God's people, had not fulfilled their mission to live for God. Go back to Matthew, if you would, Paul. Thank you. Go back to the next slide. Notice, he is communicating to the disciples something because he's on a mission to expose the purposeless living of Israel. 
God's people. And notice what he says. If, you know, you're going to do all these things if you have faith, but if you say to this mountain, it's a very specific mountain. What's the mountain? It's the mountain on which the temple is built upon. And he is saying, gentlemen, we're going up to that mountain and we're going to say, be moved. We're going to say to this, this religion, be gone. We're going to say to this philosophy of, of worship, which is really not worship, be done away with. Notice Jesus doesn't say just any mountain. I just can't go to Piastaway Peak or Camback Mountain and say, be gone. Jesus is specific in saying, there is a mountain we're going to, and it is nothing but fake worship. What has happened to the fig tree is going to happen all over this nation. And when you don't have purpose and understand your purpose from God and you're purposeless, God will condemn that. Can I tell you how important this is? Ladies and gentlemen, you have been blessed to be a blessing. That is your purpose. And what do I mean by that? As you've been loved by, by God, your mission now and your only mission is to love others in Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to tell you right now, no one in this room could say, I've got a better mission. And you can't. Pastor Scott, I want to challenge you on that. Go for it. Because the moment you tell me that there's a greater mission than telling someone about Jesus Christ, you're, that's idolatry. Because eternity is at stake. Israel had a purpose. And yet they shunned that purpose to live life according to their own will, not God's will. Do you guys track what I'm saying here? This is intense. Because the purpose that you have been planted here in this world at this time is to not only love God, to know God and love God, but to share God. And I tell you, yesterday in sports, right? We got Euro 2020. Who's watching it? Yeah, I, didn't, I thought Gunther would. He's the only cool guy here right now. Okay, I'm just going to tell you. Euro 2020, battle of the nations on the soccer field, right? What happened yesterday between Denmark and Finland? Player went down in the middle of the game, 43rd minute in the game. So Gunther's not cool anymore. Now I'm the only cool one in the room. Player for Denmark falls to the ground, collapses, 43rd minute of the game. Everyone stops, which in soccer... The, the best actors are soccer players. You guys didn't know this, right? You get hurt and you're on the, ah, right? And it's like barely a scratch. This guy's out. Every player stops and all of a sudden the soccer game doesn't matter. They all swarm around this player. All the teams start huddling. They're praying. They're talking. The game is suspended for 90 minutes. Because one player is on the ground who has just collapsed. And all of a sudden, the biggest news story in sports yesterday is how humanity wins. Yesterday, the, the greatest story in sports is that humanity cares, humanity loves, humanity hopes. Every player on that, and not only that, in the stands, which if you know anything about soccer, it's almost like gangs, right? You're a fan of your team. You, that's your gang. That's who you belong to. In the stadium, one group, the Finnish fans, start chanting Christian because that's the player's name. The other Danish fans start chanting Ericsson. That's his last name. And in unison and in sync with each other, Christian Erickson. Where, where do you have this? This is a global stage. This is an international stage where there is now something more important than who's going to win this game. It's one player who's hurt that all of a sudden everyone cares about. And I'm sitting there going, if they can do this in soccer, how can we do this in the church? How can we do this in a church when we realize that life is more than just coming to church and being together and drinking great coffee and hanging out during the week? When will we realize life is about the person that's on the field who's collapsed, who desperately needs us to come around and love them and hope for them and pray for them and just, just have greater, greater things in mind than winning a game? Ladies and gentlemen, stop treating life 
in trying to fulfill your mission. Stop treating life and trying to fulfill, you know, the things that your dreams and your dreams and hopes don't matter when it comes to God's dreams and hopes for this world. And when there's people down, you have a mission to love them. Can I get an amen from somebody? See, this is what Luke wants us to understand when it comes to God calling the people of, of Israel to live for him. If the church doesn't live for God, who will? And if the church are not pointers to God, who's going to point people to God? And I'm going to tell you right now, this is why we're here. Nothing else matters. Your calling to have now been blessed by God in Christ is to now be a blessing to others with Jesus. Nothing else matters. I'm in Cancun last week, in case you guys didn't know, and I'll probably, I won't mention that again. I don't want to make you guys envious or jealous. Cancun glow, you guys see it? I'm in, see, people would think, oh, you're in Cancun. And boy, you're just, you're checked out, you're relaxing and stuff like that. I, there's opportunities to tell people about Jesus. We had a tour guide named Jesus. Imagine that. I, I'm talking to Jesus in Cancun. And this guy all of a sudden opens up to me. How some Mormons were just there sharing them the, the false gospel, a wrong gospel. And that's what we believe here at Missio Dei. The, 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 the gospel of, the Mormonis, of Mormonism is not the true gospel. The Jesus of Mormonism is not the true Jesus. Even the president of the Mormon church said that himself. And this man, Jesus, and I are sitting on the beaches of Tulum. Can you just picture this? I've got a cerveza with a lime, stale tortilla chips, and some really hot salsa. And this man is sharing about his Catholic upbringing and how these Mormons have recently come in to share with him the, this other gospel and for an hour, I'm sharing with this man the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's our, that's our purpose, right? I got my little son sitting there, and he's just listening in. And I'm loving it because he's so engaged. He's not contributing. He's not participating. He's just listening because I want my son to know that wherever you go, there's opportunity to tell people about Jesus. There's people that, that need hope. And so this man, Jesus, and I exchanged emails, and now we've, we're on an email relationship with each other. He lives thousands of miles away, but you know what? The Spirit is working. Ladies and gentlemen, never forget about the mission God wants you to be on, and here it is. Tell people about Jesus. Amen? Nothing else matters. We can stop right now and go home. Because there's no more important understanding for your life than to pursue the things that God wants you to pursue. Because when you stand before him in eternity, he's not going to care about your mission and your purpose and your desires and your dreams. What he cares about is his gospel and his kingdom. And how did people love his son? Are you helping people love, help, helping people love Jesus? There's your mission. Point number two. Exposing a lack of pursuit to love. So we're not going to let off on this point of loving people. So things are going to get intense. I hope you guys are ready. Things are going to get intense. He now heads to the temple mountain, right? This mountain that he is going to cleanse. He's going to purge. This is what God does perfectly, right? He exposes the, the hidden and the fake things in us, and he purges them. And Why? Because Jesus wants the honor of, of God to shine forth. He doesn't want it tarnished. He doesn't want it blemished. He is here to do the Father's will. So back to Luke 19. So turn your Bibles back to Luke 19. Point number two, exposing a lack of pursuit to love. So the question is, why is Jesus so upset? He curses the fig tree. So he's on a roll. So can you imagine Jesus and the disciples? Here he is. He's, he curses the fig tree. He's got a little pep in his stab. He's like, and they're like, oh, Jesus is extra spicy today. Uh oh, look out. He walks into the temple, and all of a sudden, Mark tells us he just silently observes for a moment what's going on. And all of a sudden, he just starts ripping through the, 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 the temple, turning tables over. Birds are flying, lambs are bleeding and fleeing, and people are scattering. And Mark says he was even, as people were trying to run out with stuff, he's batting stuff out of their arms. This is not a Jesus we're used to seeing, right? Why? Because at this point, he is exposing a lack of, 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 of these people were not pursuing love for people. They had an opportunity to love people in the most holiest of places, and they chose not to. Look, look at Luke 19, verse 45. He enters the temple, 
and he begins to cast out those who were selling, and he's saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. So let's zero in on this because Jesus quotes from Isaiah. So it's always good when Jesus quotes, why is he quoting Isaiah? Look at Isaiah chapter 56. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord. So notice the word foreigner. Not just a great band from the 80s, but, but people who are not of your tribe. Who have joined themselves to the Lord. Let not the foreigner say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Isn't that a cool phrase? When you come to know God, he gives you a better name than sons and daughters. What could be better than that? Deep intimacy. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord... See, God is welcoming those who are outside Israel. God is welcoming those, those outside God's chosen people to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. He continues, Isaiah continues and says, is there a next verse? Nope, we're good? Okay, so stop right there. Do you not know that this is to be a house of prayer, a house of worship for all the nations? Ladies and gentlemen, if our purpose is a mission to love people with the gospel, it is all people. Can I just say something? And this, is, this might blow your mind. You are called to love all people. Write down that word all. All is all and that's all all means. You are called to love. You are not called to be selective. You're not called to be prideful and to say, well, God's loved me, so therefore I can now be choosy in who I love. You are called to love. What Israel was doing and why Jesus is upset on one hand is because these people of Israel had filled the temple with this commercial enterprise that prevented outsiders from coming in to see and know God. The moment we prohibit people from coming here to join us in worship is the moment I sit there and go, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. The moment we have someone stand at the door and go, yeah, you're welcome here. Uh, yeah, you're not welcome here. The moment we have someone checking people at the door and, and saying you're welcome here is the moment I sit there, I don't want to be here anymore. You are called to love all people. I don't care what their skin color is. I don't care what their political voting records like. I don't care what their sexual orientation is. You are called to love all people. We'll let God sort out all the other details when it comes to, well, you didn't know this about them. Well, big deal. All I know is I was a sinner. I was blind. I was lost. But now I see and now I'm found. Amen. Where did that come from? I don't even know. <laughs> you are called to love all people. Here's the scene. Back to Luke. Here's Jesus in the holiest place in Jerusalem. And it's turned into a wa super Walmart. There's this place called the Court of the Gentiles. And this is where this is taking place. 35 acres that everyone who is a non-Jew was allowed to go and worship in. But that was it. The Jews had filled that space with close to, and it's estimated, 300,000 lambs alone. Tables everywhere, cages everywhere, the smell of dung, manure in the air, hawkers calling out, get your lambs here, get your lambs here, fresh altar ready lambs here. Can you imagine it? Like the sweaty beer guy at the ball games, right? Get your cold buds here. Get your cold right. 
And all of a sudden, the place that was meant for reverence and reflection, consecration, had turned into this commerce and commercialization. You want to know why Jesus is upset? The people of God were prohibiting people from knowing God because it was all about their pocketbooks. It was all about their wallets. It was all about making a profit on the name of God. Wow. In the Jewish mind, they could care less about the salvation of the non-Jew. This is why they took over the temple area called the Court of the Gentiles. Big deal. They don't get to know God. I get to line my pocket with their money. And this is what's so, what's so horrible about, that, about this, and we're going to talk about this in the next point, is that they, the, the extortion that took place with these foreigners coming in who wanted to worship, but they were prevented in doing that because they were built out of all their cash. Jesus is upset and he has a right to be. He, he wants the Gentiles to know the Lord. So much for Gentile evangelism, right? This is out the window. The great sadness of the scene is that these people who were the people of God, which in reality they really weren't, they honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. They left no room for anyone not like them to, to find God. Can I just say right now, people, folks, church, family, brothers, sisters, leave room in your life for people to see Jesus. Leave room in your life for people to come to know the Lord. And don't block them out. Don't prevent them. Is there something in your life that you've set up as a wall? that's preventing people from seeing Jesus. Because there's no greater responsibility we have as those who've been blessed to help people know God and love God. Write down those two words, knowing and loving. Back, back to purpose, back to mission. If there's any mission or purpose in your life that does not entail people knowing and loving God, you're on the wrong path. You're on the wrong path. And this is what the Jews should have known. Not only are they depriving non-Jews a place to worship, but they're even victimizing them. And horrible things have been done in the name of religion. Can I get an amen? amen. Christians are the worst. Christians are the worst. Jesus is not going to clear the church of sinners. He's going to clear the church for sinners. Do you guys get what I just said? He's not coming in and say, boy, I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure just everyone who's polished and perfect and has their life all together, I'm going to make room for more of those. Uh -uh. You know what he's clearing the space for? People who are desperate in needing to know hope. And I wonder how many times Jesus comes to our church and says, we're the misfits. Where are the socially marginalized? Where are the outcasts? Where are the punks? Where are the loners? Where are the losers? Right? Unless we make room for those people in our life, what, what good are we? Right? We're thinking about Sunday best. You ever heard that phrase, Sunday best? You need to be thinking about Sunday least. Let's rephrase this. Sunday best is all about appearances and performance. Sunday least is about loving all people. So are you going to put on your Sunday lease today? And are you going to look for the Sunday lease? Because this is not about Sunday best. It's about Sunday lease. Point number three. Gets better. Exposing a lack of pursuit to love. No, we just did that. Exposing a lack of purity in worship. See, I'm paying attention. <laughs> Yay. Jesus clears the temple. He, he, he's, he's, he's batting things out of people's arms. He's turning tables over. He says, my house shall be, a, and notice what he says, my house. This is an awesome phrase. This is not, this, when people say, oh, where do you go? Oh, I go to Scott's church. Just so you guys know, this is not my church. Can I get an amen from somebody? This is God's church. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a steward of this, but this is, this is about Christ's church. This is not about God. This is not, this is not about Scott's church. He walks into the temple. He says, this is my house. 
this is my house. And this house is for everybody. And you've turned it into a den for robbers. What? Right here. He's now going to expose something important about worship and it's purity. And can I just tell you, there's been something that I've, I've constantly thought about when it comes to, to the church. And it's this. How we've allowed outside influences to affect us as a church negatively and we've lost the purity of what we need to do as the people of God. We don't need to change. We don't, we don't need to perform uh, Billie Eilish on the stage to attract people to Jesus. Does she even do this? I don't even know. I'm just going <laughs> to assume rock position, right? You know, we don't need to have Superman come in and be like, hey guys, look at me. We don't need to have tight jeans, big screens, and laser beams, right, to get people to Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. You know what you need? You need to be the authentic people of God, worship from, from our hearts, not just from our lips, open the word, celebrate communion, baptize people, that's it. And yet a lot of churches have bought into other methods to reach people. And I, and I can agree to disagree with some of their philosophy that I'm going to tell you right now, but it's a slow, slippery slope where you begin to lose the purity of what God wants you to do. You know what? People are, are coming in who don't know Jesus. They're not looking for Superman and laser beams and tight beams. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for people who are authentically living in a relationship with the living God of the universe. And you don't need to water that down. You don't need to, you, you let the spirit do the work. You let the spirit do the work. And when people see us different, and we are, can I just tell you, in, in Christ, you're different. When people see that and it's not like the world, that's a good thing. You don't have to become like the world to win the world. You are called to be different, countercultural, different in your ethics, different in your morals, different in your beliefs, different in, in your marriage. And that's, those are stepping stones of conversations on why you are different. But the Jews had not learned this. They became just like everyone else around them. And this is why Jesus says at the end of verse 46, look at it. But you have made this a robber's den, meaning the caves in which people would, do, they would do wicked acts and they'd go hide in the caves. And so Jesus is saying to these people, you have turned God's house into a cave where you have now done wicked things and you're here hiding out and no one's calling you out on it. Can I just tell you sometimes on Sunday mornings, the greatest collection of sinners is right here in the church. Go ahead and look at the person next to you like this carefully and be like, I'm, I'm not the only one. Guess what? Because guess what? this week, you guys, you've been hypocrites. This week, I've been a hypocrite. This week, you've been a murderer. This week, you've been an adulterer. This week, you've been a liar. And you know what? To get called out on it, there's something good about this. It's like I don't have to hide anymore. Yeah, I treated my wife horribly this week. Yeah, you did something at work you shouldn't have done. You know it. Now, we're not going to go around and start, you know. But don't think for a minute that the church, on the outside, we're here and we're all thinking, well, because we're a church, we're good. This is a cave of robbers. This is a den of thieves. Right? We're, the key is we're not hiding it. Can I tell you right now, I want us to have relationships where we don't have to hide. Right? We don't have to, we can be ourselves and be loved and be accepted. But knowing that in a loving, gracious relationship, people can call us out sometimes on things. Right? Men approach me and I know they're for me and they can address things in my life. And you know what? I welcome that. Because guess what, church? Believe it or not, write this down. Pastor Scott's not perfect. Write that down. I make, I'm going to offend you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you mad. But let's not play kindergarten rules. Yeah, he looked at me the wrong way. Yeah, like, like, let's man up. Woman up. Put our big boy panties on. Like, let's realize that we... This is not a place to hide. This is a place to be transparent and vulnerable. 
And yet these people were only hiding in their wickedness. Jesus wasn't, of all the people that should have known, these people should have known. And they, they were covering it up by their egos and their economy. Check this out. You have made God's house a robber's den. And instead of praying for people, these Jews were praying on people and making matters worse. You can't help someone worship if you're taking advantage of them. Here's the scene, right? It's like going to a concert. Boy, the days of concerts, they're coming back. I remember going to a U2 concert, only seen them eight times. Not bragging, but I'm just saying. I remember going to get beers. $20! You know what I was thinking of the rest of that concert? Not how good the music was, how I got robbed. Anyone else been there? Bottle of water, 15 bucks. You're sitting there going, it's like, okay, I get this for 79 cents. You ever been there before? See, it's the little things that we can do to, towards one another, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. We can prevent people from worshiping God. Here at Missio, we hand out free Bibles. What if I started charging for these Bibles? You want a Bible, Sharon? $50. But how am I supposed to know? How am I supposed to know the word? Well, 50 bucks. You can, you can know God's word. But it says on here $2.99. I don't care what it says. I'm going to charge you 50 We do things and we make it impossible for people to enjoy God. We need to evaluate the purity of our worship. Is there anything false in me? Is there anything just wicked in me? Is there anything sinful in me? And God, please remove it. So not only can I have a better understanding of who I am in light of who you are, but to help others see that as well. This is, what, this is why Jesus quotes not only Isaiah 56, Jeremiah 7, where the house of robbers comes from. Look at this. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there is a word and say, hear the word of the Lord. All you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. Get right before God and, and he'll let us dwell here. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, right? For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, notice the one another's, right? Like if you love one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, right? Don't make it hard for them. The fatherless, the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place. Notice the other-centered focus. And if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I give uh, of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words, but to no avail. You steal, you murder, you commit adultery, you swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you, that you have not known. And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we're delivered. That's fake. You don't do those things and then come and hide here and, and, and think that you're accepted by God. He wants the real you, right? You don't say we're delivered when you live a life of hypocrisy. Only to go on doing these abominations has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers. And then he continues. And he says this. Is there any more? No? Nope? Okay, we're stopping there again. You can read it on your own. Here's what Jesus is calling out. Religious hypocrisy. Right? One thing I want for myself, for my wife, for my family, for this church, is for us to be the real deal. Stop being fake. You don't fake it till you make it in God's church. You know, how you, wait, you know how you make it? Become broken, become real, become genuine, become honest. This is what God wants. But it's got to be a work of His Spirit in our hearts. I don't want this to be a, 
I don't want this to be a den of robbers. I want this to be a hospital of the authentic. Something like you don't get this anywhere else. And sometimes just it starts with just us relating to one another in a, in a very real way and saying, let's grab coffee and let's just talk. And you know what I praise God for? Stories I've heard from you, situations I've heard about your life, and you've shared openly, and you've shared uh, transparently, and you know what? You know you're loved. There's nothing anyone could ever say, at least to me, because, you know, I'm El Jefe or the pastor, whatever you want to call me. El Jefe, you like that? Good, get a shirt, El Jefe. El Jefe de Jesus, right? No, I'm not the boss. He's the boss of me. Okay, we'll get there. See how bad my Spanish is? No wonder they kicked us out. That's, let's be honest, that's what happened. I've never sat with any one of you in any one-on-one -on -one setting. And you shared something with me, and I thought, oh! <gasps> it's not what we do, right? The moment you share something deep and transparent and vulnerable, and that person across from you is like, oh my goodness, like, no, that's not what we do. We, we all have a story. The question is, how will our stories become ultimately his story? And that's our goal. And that's how we protect the purity of what God wants us to do. We're not going to be people that just honor God with our lips. We're going to be good people who honor God with our hearts. Amen? And we finish with this. This is a real, real short point. God wants to expose a lack of passion to hear. And this is why Luke finishes this chapter, and he says he's, in these two verses, 47. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the religious leaders refuse to hear Jesus. They only wanted to destroy him. But verse 48 says, but they couldn't find an opportunity to do this because why? So many people had gathered around him and were hanging upon his words. Here's what I know. The only way to retain purpose, the only way to pursue others in love, and the only way to protect purity in worship is to hang upon the words of Jesus. Have you lost track of your purpose for living? You're not listening to Jesus. Have you lost the ability to love others, even others that are not like you? You've, lost, you've, you've refused to hear the words of Jesus. Have you lost the purity in your worship and it's gotten convoluted with other gods? You've lost the ability to hear Jesus. Here's my question to you. How are you hanging on the words of Jesus today? And this is not like just a casual like, oh yeah, I'm just listening. You know, I hear him. I see his jaws flapping. I hear once in a while something comes out like God, worship. But to get to a place as a disciple where you have a passion to hear and hang on the words of Jesus, then your life begins to really move. Here's the problem. You're hanging on the words of everybody else. And you're not hanging on the words of Jesus. And we're wondering, why did my life end up like this? Because you're paying attention to too many other voices. And can I tell you, the voices are out there. What are some of the voices that compete for our attention? Open floor right now. Other voices, where are, what are they? Facebook. Just so you know, that's old. That's old. Facebook's old now. What else? TV, what else? Family, what else? Friends, what else? Work, what else? Te what is it? Telegram. Oh, sorry. I'm not cool. What else? QAnon. Horrible. What else? Seriously. I'm going to devote a whole message on that. <laughs> Cult false beliefs right there. All right, what else? What is it? Joel? <laughs> oh, now we're going specific, right? Soon you're going to say, Pastor Scott. Right? Like, no. Here's what. 
all the things we mentioned are not inherently evil for the most part. But what's bad about them is that we give them too much time. I'm not saying disregard your family. I'm not saying don't go on social media. You have to be men and women mature enough to say, I'm giving it too much time in my life. Until you hang on the words of Christ, you know what that means? It means you're sitting there going, I can't wait for him to open his mouth again because it's going to be so good. You're hanging. I want to hear him speak. Peter saying, Jesus, like, where else are we to go? Because no one else has the words of eternal life. Do you believe that? Because here's what I want. I want to create a culture where men and women hang on the words of Jesus. Because that is what's going to make you in line with God's mission for your life. That's going to make you love other people who especially are not like you. And it's going to help you protect purity in your worship. Passion to hear Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. you know it. So that was Monday, Passion Week. Next week, Tuesday. Ooh, can't wait. It's going to get good. Because here's what Jesus does. He goes back to the temple to keep teaching. This is not, he's going to go back. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to accelerate his own sentence to die. Because I can't, I can't help but just leave you with this message. God does this so that you can love him. You don't say the things Jesus said. You don't do the things Jesus said unless there's a greater purpose, and that is to save you and I from our sins and a life of hopelessness. Who thanks God for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who thanks God for the cross of Jesus Christ? So thank you, Lord, not only for your teaching, but for the fact that you gave your life for me. Things are going to get intense. Looking forward to it. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for a wonderful church community. Thank you for helping us make sense of the, the message of Scripture. Lord, to understand that meekness is not weakness. To understand that you are a God who is passionate about in the souls of men and women. You're a God who's passionate about protecting your glory, and those are, those are great things. Thank you for helping us understand. Help us to continue to, to walk in your ways. Help us to continue to, to live lives that are pleasing and honorable to you. Help us to live lives that help lead others and not hinder them from knowing Jesus, Lord. Thank you again for this morning, for being our God, for loving us like you do, for uh, the fact that you have given us a new a, a name greater than sons and daughters, an everlasting name. So Lord, thank you for such unconditional grace and mercy and kindness that you've shown us. And we can only celebrate this because of what Jesus has done for, for us. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior, Father. Thank you for loving us through your Son. Help us to live for your glory. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.